Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. And this week we'll be looking at a few projects, uh, hacking everything from microwaves to uh, IKEA smart sensors and some incredible projects from the Electromaker website that use very few resources indeed. Um, but we're also going to be looking at some new hardware, some of which you can just straight up buy, some of which you can support on CrowdSupply, which if you're not familiar is a bit like Kickstarter but just for awesome development kits and hardware and things like that. So with all of that to get through, let's get on with the show. First up this week, we're going to be looking at a Raspberry Pi Pico project from Matthias Vandal. Now, uh, the name Matthias Wandel, I suppose is how most people pronounce it, is something that may be familiar with you because he is, well, was for a long time, at least to me, um, the person who I go to on YouTube to look up anything to do with woodworking. In fact, his uh, How to Build a Simple Table Guide, um, which I think has been updated since then, um, is the first woodworking large-scale project that I really undertook myself as an adult. Um, but, uh, and yes, if you are wanting to find out more about this, if you just search for uh, Matthias uh, uh, Wandel, his YouTube channel is well subscribed and for good reason. It's full of incredible projects and just uh, bits of information you only learn from a lifetime of being a master of working with wood. Um, but he is also someone who is an embedded engineer and a recent project of his really caught my eye. So this is a video from Matthias's second channel, and this is uh, programming the Raspberry Pi Pico, or it's actually programming an RP2040 board, like a, a, one of those tiny Pico boards that he'll be showing in just a moment, um, to sense the current on his microwave. Now, why would you want to sense microwave current? Well, it turns out that your microwave uh, has different current requirements depending on what it is doing. I mean, obviously when it's not cooking, when it's cooking, it will have vastly different current requirements, but things like when the light is on inside the microwave and when it's off has a different current requirement as well. Why would you need to do this? Well, it turns out that one of the things in the Van, uh, Wandel household that is a bit of an annoyance is that they will put food in the microwave to warm it up around dinner time but they'll not be in the room when the uh, microwave finishes so they won't hear it finish and then forget that something was in there discover the food later when it was cold so the idea here is to put together a project that will sense has something just been put into cook has it finished cooking and then put an alarm code every however long it takes until they open the door. And of course, opening the door will turn the light on, changing the amount of current the microwave is using, and then letting the Pi Pico know that it doesn't need to set its alarm tone anymore. Now, I've given a very brief and perhaps not fantastic explanation of uh, the project. He goes into much more detail, obviously. But the thing about this that's quite nice is that this is a Pi Pico project programming the RP2040 in the C and C++ SDK, using their SDK. Um, and as he mentions at the start of the video, there aren't a huge amount of resources still about it, despite the fantastic Getting Started guide from Raspberry Pi themselves. Um, in terms of actual projects using the SDK that are uh, of this level, um, a, a simple does one thing project, there aren't that many. And, uh, and of course, Matthias being Matthias, he explains it wonderfully and uh, provides all the code that you would need to make this yourself too, um, and uh, also uh, explains what's going on here, but it is very simple. It's a, a simple current clamp and a piezo buzzer that is doing all of the lifting here. The rest is just logic on the Pico itself. One thing that is interesting is that getting the RGB LED working on the board turns out to be uh, kind of non-trivial, and he had to jump in and do a little bit of assembly, which again, he explains very well. Um, yeah, just I am a big fan of seeing what is in essence quite a simple project explained in detail by someone who clearly knows what they're doing uh, to someone like me who's still very much a hobbyist I do like working with the C and, S, uh, C and C++ SDK with the Pi Pico but most of the time I will just use MicroPython because it is simpler and much quicker and time is something that I do not have a lot of so hearing someone explain how they work through it and work with all the issues is really really quite interesting so yes um, I will leave a link to uh, Matthias's video in the description and as I say um, his woodworking stuff is fantastic I wasn't actually aware that he was an embedded engineer until recently um, and yeah this is a really interesting interesting project. I'd love to know what you think of it. Of course, this being Matthias, he also puts a wonderful wooden case around it. Have I been... is he called Matthias? I, I... you know what? I have maybe been mispronouncing his name for the entirety of this section. If you happen to see this, Matthias, Matthias, and I've said your name wrong, I hugely apologize. You are absolutely not the only one. I have been getting people's names wrong on the internet for a very long time. It's a problem. Now, we're going to move on to a project from the Raspberry Pi website, and this is a project from Alistair Allen. And if that's a name you recognize, it's because we've spoke to Alistair Allen here at Electromaker before. He is the head of documentation at Raspberry Pi. And in fact, um, we did a full interview with him. He's a thoroughly interesting bloke, and I really would have loved to get him back on for a follow-up interview. Uh, sadly, for the time being, at least, the Electromaker interview series had to be canned just because the time it took to get it together and working isn't something that we 
can fit into our budget and time at Electromaker. Um, I, I've spoken a lot about the limited time frame I have in order to get this show out, uh, along with everything else. And so unfortunately, that's something that fell by the wayside. I do have hopeful plans for the future that it could be resurrected, and I'm sure Alistair will be one of the first guests I invite back when it is. Anyway, long story short, I had a really long and interesting interview with Alistair, um, who is the head of documentation at Raspberry Pi. If you wonder why the getting started with MicroPython and the C and C++ SDK uh, documentation is so good, it's because he brought his entire philosophy of how things can be documented to Raspberry Pi and worked with the team in order to revamp the way it all worked. Um, and it shows, you can tell that. Um, However, um, he also is a, a dedicated hacker all of his own, um, and we talked about some of the interesting things he's done uh, in the past using uh, Raspberry Pis for astrophysics and things like that. And he, uh, yeah, he turns, turns out that he's still at it very much and is working with the uh, IKEA smart sensor set, which is designed to uh, work. Actually, I think this is one of their uh, smart sensors, the Vindrichting. Vindrichtening, it's a very IKEA name, um, is an air quality sensor, and I don't know if it actually works with the rest of their smart suite. Uh, I know other people have hacked those ones, but um, this is actually a hardware hack in that it's taking uh, points from the PCB, attaching them to a Raspberry Pi Pico W, and turning what is a standalone air quality sensor into a web-enabled air quality sensor. So the Vindrichtning is an IKEA air quality sensor. It's quite cheap, 15 pounds, um, and it is a micro USB powered uh, PCB, which has an air quality sensor on it, a small microcontroller, and a green, yellow, and red LED to give you a rough indication of air quality. And this is a PM 2.5, so smaller air particulates, which are the ones that can be, I mean, no, amount of air particulates is good, but the smaller ones are more dangerous. They're much more likely to end up in your bloodstream and cause problems. So how do you go about hacking one of these? Well, Alistair found out that there are test points inside. So from those test points, you can get uh, five volts ground and the reading from the uh, sensor, which is what he's done here. Uh, you can see he's uh, uh, soldered to these test points and he's also soldered to a Raspberry Pi Pico W and he's using a debug probe here in order to program it. Um, just a note, I think he mentions it here in the article as well. If you're using, yes, he does. Of course he does, because He's the guy who does the documentation. Um, if you're using vSys to power a Pico, you can't also use the micro USB uh, port as well um, because that could overpower it. Um, uh, that could damage the microcontroller. Anyway, um, he also added another sensor to it. He added a uh, one of these BMP280, the barometric pr pressure and temperature sensors, um, in order to add a little bit of functionality to the box itself. And the beauty of doing this is that this all fits inside the uh, the case. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful because obviously this is something that has sensitive uh, measurement equipment inside it, and you don't want to, um, to, to mess that up. But yeah, all of the code is here. Um, and if I remember correctly from when I read this article before, this is actually example code from from uh, Liz Clark, Blitz, Blitz City DIY, who now works for Adafruit, um, doing uh, a bunch of things like um, making tutorials and yeah, lots of wonderful things. So um, as you can see, it all fits happily inside the case just like this and completely changes up how this thing works, gives this air quality sensor a an online presence. And you could obviously write whatever uh, web server you wanted on the Pi Pico to look at the air quality in real time wherever you are. Um, but yeah, I love this. I love this kind of stuff. <clears throat> As I said, with just the last project, it's a complete coincidence that both of these are Pi Pico projects. I actually chose the Matthias Wandel project a couple of weeks ago, but it never made its way onto a show, and I still wanted to share it. Two different Raspberry Pi Pico projects approaching things from two different ways, giving a, a new kind of functionality to things that didn't have it before. I really love seeing that kind of stuff. If you are enjoying the Electromaker show, would you take just a moment to check that you are actually subscribed to the Electromaker YouTube channel? Uh, doing this will add us to your subscriptions tab here on the left. Um, you can take it a step further by uh, selecting all notifications here. And this means just up in the top right next to your username, you'll get a notification whenever we upload videos to the site. Now, usually we put up one YouTube video per week, occasionally two when we have a product of the week as well as an Electromaker show. Occasionally though, we go to events and we have a plethora of interviews with the actual people making the hardware. Uh, some people love that, some people aren't so keen on that, but it does only happen once or twice a year. Um, and the one other thing that uh, is an asinine thing that everyone does is asks for uh, YouTube likes, and I just interrupted myself for a moment there. Um, but yes, if you do click for, uh, if you do click like on this video, it will actually make a difference, not only to us, I mean, we like to know that you like it, but it also gives YouTube a very solid message that you are enjoying this kind of content and will likely show it to other people who like to watch the same kind of stuff about Maker and Embedded Fun. However, uh, there 
there are ways that you can support us that aren't clicking things on YouTube, but do cost you a little bit of money. However, you do get something in return. And that is because Electromaker has a shop. Electromaker.io slash shop. And as you can see from the name scrolling across the top of the screen, we stock a lot of things from a lot of people. Whether you're looking for your first Raspberry Pi or Arduino starter kit for yourself or as a gift for others or something a bit more specific, you may find that we have it. We also stock 3D printing supplies and we can also do bulk orders if you need something for your business. Um, if you have any questions like that, you can always get in touch with our support um, or ring our support. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, if you head to electromica.io slash shop and see if there's anything that catches your fancy, that uh, really helps us directly. We have no advertising on our videos. We do not have a Patreon or anything like that. We just have a shop. So um, with all of that talking about how you can support the show, let's continue on with the show. Now, uh, we just had the release of the Arduino Nano ESP32 variant, the uh, IoT board, um, but there's still a lot of people out there doing amazing things with just your regular old school Arduino Nano, the same one that's been around forever, the same one that's been cloned a million times. Um, and these two projects show two different arms of what you can still do with the AT Mega 328P chip. Um, one, which is taking incredibly simple things and making something very complicated out of it, and uh, the second is taking and repurposing something in a very complicated way. All will become clear, but yeah, first, laser tag. So first let's just take a moment to appreciate this image. This is sort of amazing. Um, this is an image of laser tag guns and I, the best I can sort of do with it really is to get it about that size. Um, but what you're looking at here is two uh, completely cardboard fabricated laser tag guns and they look amazing don't they? They really are works of art in and of themselves. Um, and this is what I mean, this project uh, takes a few basic parts out of an Arduino starter kit and turns them into really functional looking laser tag weapons. Um, now we'll go through the electronics of how this all works in just a moment but before we move on from this image I do want to point out that um, the the, uh, the the cutout that you can see just here, where my mouse is, I don't know how clear that is, um, is a cutout for the loading mechanism of the laser rifle. So when you load it back and forwards, that is what loads the next shot into the barrel, as it were. I mean, it's a laser rifle, but either way. Um, and the trigger just here also uh, is a working trigger, all made out of cardboard, all, decide, all designed to uh, click the switches underneath the cardboard, but still feel like tactile things that you can use. Um, yeah, I just wanted to really give a shout out to the craft element of this project before we even start on the electronics because it's absolutely incredible. So this project from Mail Studio uses an Arduino Nano as the brains as I mentioned at the start of this section um, and yeah the, the, basically this came out of them being a big fan of laser tag. Now uh, there is a video of uh, the entire project and the idea behind it. The video is in French and I don't speak French but luckily the uh, article is all in English so you can get it, pick it up anyway. It's worth watching the video anyhow just to see how it came together and again to get a look at these absolutely wonderful looking cardboard guns. It's a really amazing thing thing. Now, everything required for this project should be found in an Arduino starter kit. Essentially, all you need is some kind of a microcontroller, you need an infrared LED for sending infrared, you need an infrared receiver for receiving uh, the infrared, um, and the uh, seven segment displays for the uh, how many lives you have left, um, as well as a few buttons and a few LEDs, and as it says in the video, uh, yeah, some wires, well actually, a lot of wires. So before we go any further, let's briefly see it in action. So there's the reloading animation. And that was the last few lives of the other gun, and as you heard, it played a na 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 as in a, oh dear, you have lost. Um, and just to give it a little bit of perspective, if we move uh, slightly further back in the video, you can see the reloading animation a little bit better. Yeah, that little spinning display uh, on the top there. Um, it's just, it, like I say, it's just incredible how chunky and how uh, kind of well made this seems, given that it is made out of cardboard. So just briefly, um, the the circuit is uh, relatively simple. I understand that attaching a seven segment display might be a little bit intimidating if you are uh, um, uh, just getting started with electronics, uh, but once you have it up and running, they are a really good way of getting used to how these kind of displays work. Um, the code is very easy to follow as well. Um, and uh, the other thing that uh, is interesting about this is that since this is using an infrared um, dis uh, sender and receiver, um, there are many libraries that work with this. And in, in this particular example, they're using the IR remote library, um, and it will send certain kind of hex um, uh, via uh, infrared. This is the same way that your television remote works and, and anything like that. If you're not familiar with infrared, um, when you press a button on your television remote, it's sending a specific code, which is how your television knows whether to turn on or off or change the channel. Um, 
So you could set this up and make a whole load of red guns and a whole load of blue guns and have teams where they can only shoot the other person and there's no friendly fire. Just kind of an interesting point there. Um, but yes, this is a fantastic project using the Arduino Nano. It looks amazing and it uses only the bits that you will probably find in an Arduino starter kit. If you would like to find out more about it, you can head to the link in the description of this video and you can find that including all of the code. And yeah, Mail Studio, what a fantastic project. Now we're going to move on to this rotating display and I, there's no way I'm going to have enough time to talk about this in a way that does enough justice to it because this is a perfectly balanced persistence of vision PCB in the shape of a CD that sits on top of a repurposed CD motor in order to create a display. Um, and rather than me try and explain that any further, let me just show you a short clip from the fantastic video of the uh, person that made this. Um, this person is called LHM0 on the Electromaker website. However, they also go under the name Maker Electronics Projects on YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, this is their rundown of how this works. And it is amazing. It's a 32 minute video that deserves to be a 32 minute video because it explains everything that happens in e extreme detail, including things like how to get perfect symmetry on your PCB so that it will spin like a CD. Um, and yeah, um, don't be put off by the flickering here. That is the camera. Um, if you try and uh, shoot persistence of vision things with a camera, the camera shutter speed will never line up with it perfectly. When you're looking at a persistence of vision just Play in real life you cannot see this flickering at all and you're kind of getting an idea of what is going on here this is a clock or an analog display of various types that is attached to the internet and um, if we find another part of the video where it is not spinning anymore you can see exactly how that works we have the arduino nano down here that's running everything in, uh, uh, and um, running the show and we also have an esp uh, for communicating here and the idea is um, this is programmed to attach to your local internet and then yeah you just uh, sign into it via the ip address on your phone and it can tell you various things and it can yeah do whatever you ask it to do. You can change the brightness, you can display its IP address, uh, you can show various things. And the whole idea of it displaying its IP address, by the way, is for obvious reasons. It means that if you plug this in and it attaches to your router, um, it will be assigned an IP address and you can just look at it in order to then know how to get to it with the web um, and change it. Now, as I said, I've given a very high level view of this project, but the video goes into amazing amounts of detail, including, as mentioned before, how to get the correct access to symmetry and all of the electronics required in order to get it working. So I strongly recommend that you head to this page and watch the fantastic explanation video of this project. There are many things that I can only touch on that are explained in great detail, like the fact that the timing obviously has to be very, very specific um, because you need to make sure that you have the right amount of pixels displayed per revolution so that by measuring the, uh, the revolution speed using a whole effect sensor, you can then use that to generate the timing for each uh, set of pixels that goes out in order to get an image that doesn't waver over time. Um, the other thing that I didn't even mention so far is that this entire top PCB is powered completely wireless, wirelessly underneath from a Royer converter. I believe that's what you call that. Um, and there's a PWM control on the side in order to speed up or slow it down in order to get the image working better. So with those two things uh, together, you can see that you could tweak it and, uh, and it will speed up and slow down and then it will do a calculation on the fly in order to regenerate the image and then you can just work out from your eyes whether you're getting a better persistence of vision effect or not. Um, this is truly a wonderful project, and like I said, this kind of comes from the other end of the scale. Um, whereas we had a cardboard laser tag system using very simple ideas, this is using, okay, kind of very simple and cheap parts, but to do something incredibly complicated and to come up with something that looks absolutely wonderful as an output. Um, and of course, um, as well as the video itself, this is absolutely wonderfully documented on the Electromaker site as well. Um, I love projects like this. I love projects that take ideas, like I said, CD drive. I realized we've become one of those families that does not own anything with a CD drive in it. It is a weird time that we live in, given that my entire childhood was tapes and then CDs, and I still have loads of them. And even if I had my whole collection here, okay, I still have tape players. I don't have any CD drives at all in the entire house. It's such a weird thing. Um, yes, repurposing a CD drive and making such a balanced PCB that it works like this is a wonderful thing. And yeah, the level of detail in the, in the documentation is wonderful too. So two fantastic Arduino Nano original OG Nano projects. Both of them are in the description of this video. So on last week's show, we talked about our product of the week, which was the Arduino Nicola Sense ME. Now the Nicola, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, the Nicola line, are Arduino Pro's line of very, very small, very, very powerful boards. And the Sense ME is no different. It has a bunch of sensors on it and it is designed for working with Edge AI. If you'd like to find out more, there'll be a link to it in the description of this video. Robin talks about it in the product of the week video. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to love about the Nicola boards. Um, there's various different variations of them. This one has a bunch of different sensors on it. As you can see, magnetometer, pressure sensor, 
sensor, a 4-in-1 gas sensor, and a motion sensor. All of those things can be used uh, with Edge Impulse to train and then deploy models back onto it with absolutely no um, extra coding required. It's sort of an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, but yes, uh, we started the, pro uh, the competition last week for one of our viewers to win it, and now it is time for that winner to be chosen. And without any further ado, our winner this week is Maxwell James with the comment SenseME, uh, which is the hashtag you had to use to enter the competition. Um, I am not entirely sure what I'd do with a Nikola SenseME, but I'd probably try and make some kind of device that can fit on my wrist. Now, uh, Maxwell James is a name that I recognize because he's put a few projects up on the Electromega website. Um, and I can only wonder, uh, given the things that he has put up on the Electromega website, uh, exactly what he's going to do with an Edge AI powered tiny little board. I'm sure you're going to put it on your wrist, Maxwell, but what what will you do with it once it is on your wrist? And do I want to know? Well, I do actually. Please do put it on the Electromaker website when you come up with a project with it. I will be very interested to see uh, what you come up with. But yes, congratulations, Maxwell, and thank you to everyone who joins these competitions. We will be continuing to give away every product of the week we have for the rest of the year, so there will be plenty more chances to win. And um, as I uh, mentioned from time to time, there was a time when uh, we'd have a panel of judges pick winners for these competitions. We decided quite a while ago that the uh, fairest thing to do is just to have the hashtags um, and then check the hashtags for duplicate entries and then just choose a winner at random, and that's what we've been doing ever since. Um, so yeah, uh, there's every chance that you could maybe win the next product of the week. If you haven't entering them and you haven't won one as of yet, do continue to do so and we will be back with a new product of the week very, very soon. Moving on to funding website things, an inventively titled part of the show where we look at things on funding websites. And that might be things like Kickstarter or GoFundMe, but a lot of the time we find ourselves on CrowdSupply. And that's for a very specific reason, because uh, CrowdSupply has exactly the kind of stuff that we talk about on the show. It specializes in hardware and hardware projects and different things that work around that. So there's a few things if you've watched the show before you may recognize. We've talked about Milk, v, uh, Milk 5 recently um, and the Pocket Reform as well. Um, and we also talked about the Slime VR body trackers. These are ones that have all Done very well and got funded uh, but what we like to do a lot of the time is talk about the things that are just up and coming and that's exactly what we're going to do today so gg tag this is an e-ink display uh, with a lot of very interesting capabilities so let's start with the simple stuff it's an e-ink display um, and you update it using well you can do it by usb serial programming that's absolutely fine um, this is plugging it uh, with an uh, on the go port into a phone um, and it is attaching via usb serial and this is uh, in the browser, by the way. They have a full browser app for doing this, so you don't need to download any specific app or anything. And it will update it here. So uh, you just sort of updated once, and now they've got another one, and they're going to say they're going to connect the GG tag. And there you go. So updated fine simple however you can also update it using sound and i know that updating things using sound isn't new but it's still something that i find so interesting and cool so uh, you press a button it makes a futuristic um, <laughs> very futuristic sound very sci-fi from the 70s sound um, and it has reprogrammed the tag and as you're about to see their browser app is simple enough to just move things around and change things up um he's moved the uh, the moved the um the name of the website there, click the reset button on the side, and now it is reprogrammed again. So that in and of itself is really cool, but it gets even more cool when you realize that this thing can emulate RFID tags. So same as before, programming using sound. And now this e-paper display has an RFID value. And if you take something that can read RFID, like for example, the pen, pen testing tool um, uh, Flipper Zero here, um, there. It has read the RFID tag, and this can be done with a USB RFID reader too. So it kind of changes what this is to me. Um, this was an e-paper display. I thought, oh, that looks cool. Programming by sound, very cool. But actually, this me to me now means more. Those blank RFID cards that you see um, could be e-paper displays. That's what this is, essentially. This is a display that can be used as an RFID card, or it could just be used as an e-paper display, or both. Um, and given the fact that all of the price tags in my local supermarket are now e-paper displays, I can see a lot of potential uses for this, not just in hobby projects, but in the in industry as well. Yeah, if it's something that interests you, um, there is a pre-launch page, as always. There is no price for this. This is a pre-launch page. We will find out once the project launches. If you would like to find out more, there is a box here that you can subscribe to in order to get more information, and you will get emails whenever the project has updates including when the project goes live and that's when we'll find out how much this development kit costs but it does seem like a very tidy and well thought out and finished thing already doesn't it um i'd be very interested to get my hands on one of these and have a fiddle with it and uh, who knows what with this being electromega if i do i will probably end up giving it to one of you lot
Moving on to the Raspberry Bread Stick, and yes, this is an RP2040 development board that is long like a breadstick. It is also presumably designed to fit into a bread board, and it spaces out the pins to make it a little bit easier to work with them instead of having to cram loads of jumper cables together. Uh, there's a few other things that we'll get into. One thing that is sort of interesting is that you think with a name like breadstick, if it was designed to work on a bread board, there might be an image of it on a bread board, but there isn't. Um, anyway, um, lots of things to like here. RP2040 microcontroller, so programmable with MicroPython, CircuitPython, C, C++, uh, SDK, uh, USB-C connector, uh, but it also has a couple of extras, um, as well as all of the pins that are nicely spread out. There are 24 of these minuscule um, NeoPixel addressable LEDs. I think they're called dot stars, these tiny little ones. Um, and uh, there's also an inertial measurement unit on it, a six axis, so three gyroscope, three accelerometer, three axis gyroscope, three axis uh, accelerometer. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's about it. It is a, a, a really nicely form-factored uh, Raspberry Pi Pico-esque board. Now, again, pre-launch project, no price as of yet. Uh, presumably images of it with a breadboard coming up soon because I think it would be absolutely hilarious if this thing didn't fit on a breadboard given its form factor. I'm fairly certain that this is just a, a, a quirk of the images they have of their lovely mock-up. Well, it's not a mock-up. This is a, a, a working prototype. Um, and this will be launching soon. There's not a huge amount more to say about it other than the usual. If you would like to know more about it, you can always enter your um, email address into the box here. Although I frequently come back to pre-launch projects on crowd supply in order to talk about them further when they are priced um, to add any information that they may not have had in the pre-launch page and to tell you how much they are so you can buy one and support their project <laughs> We are going to close out this week's show by talking about two separate boards that share the Orange Pi Zero form factor. Now, that form factor is 5 by 5 centimeters, and in fact one of those boards is the latest variation of the Orange Pi Zero, the third variation of it. But before we get to that, we're going to talk about the Mango Pi RISC-V router that's coming up. And there's not all that much information on it yet. This is something that Mango Pi, who have put out other RISC-V Linux SPCs, one of which is confusingly the Raspberry Pi Zero form factor, this is the Orange Pi Zero form factor, um, but this is, as you can see, a, a router board. It has two Ethernet ports. It has an RJ485. I always forget exactly what that is, but it is written here. RS485 uh, communication port just here. Um, two USB 2 ports and a USB uh, power delivery port, al along with a GPIO expansion pedder uh, just here. Um, uh, but other than this image, there wasn't a huge amount to go on. However, as always, CNX Software have done a bit of digging, have checked through everything that MangoPie have said about it, and have given a fairly uh, good rundown of what it is. Um, the one thing that is not uh, clear right now is when this thing will be available. There's no time scale on it or kind of price at all. Um, it just basically says, yeah, this thing will be coming. Um, and if you would like to know more about it, head to the link in the description of this video for this CNX Software article. It tells you everything that there is to know about it so far, including what stats they have. Have. Um, but yeah, uh, other than open WRT support, which is of course the, the, the Linux uh, OS designed specifically for working with routers, there's not much more to say about it. Um, but RISC-V would be the perfect choice for a processor on a router if you think about it, because there's this uh, open source infrastructure for making your own uh, Infrastructure, this open source instruction set for uh, making your own processor work exactly the way you are, that's about the most secure you can possibly get. If you wanted to build something from the ground up that you understand the security of it at every single step, you could start by, yeah, spinning your own RISC-V processor up. Maybe I'm going a little bit too deep here. And just to close out the show, the Orange Pi Zero 3. Now, um, we talked about the Orange Pi Zero 2 way back when, when it was released. Um, in fact, I have an Orange Pi Zero 2. I had big plans for it to be the boss of all of my 3D printers, um, and it would have been perfectly happy to do that. It is a solid, tiny little Linux machine for the money. Um, and I think the Orange Pi Zero 2, I got it for about 30 something euros at the time, and it looks like the Zero 3 is gonna cost about the same amount. In fact, um, if I make myself disappear for a second, we can take a look at a couple of listings. So here is an Amazon.com listing for the Pi Zero Orange Pi Zero 3. This is the version with 4 gigabytes of RAM and a 16 megabyte SPI flash, and that's $33. Um, and there's a version which is exactly the same uh, on Ali AliExpress. Uh, sorry, I say exactly the same. I believe this version has... Oh, no, no. It has the 16... It says it has the 16 megabyte SPI flash on it. Maybe the red le lettering there denotes the things that can be different. Who knows? Um, but either way, um, what you get on either variant of this board is, well, a fair amount of grunt, actually. A quad-core Cortex-A53 processor, which is the all-winner H60, H618. Um, anything from 1 up to 4 gigabytes of RAM, uh, gigabit LAN support, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5, which, of course, are nice things to have. Uh, one of the things that gets missed out on some cheaper development boards is things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, because people assume they're always going to be connected 
connected via Ethernet to whatever system it is using. It can be powered by a USB type C and it has two USB uh, two ports, as you can see here as well. Oh no, I tell a lie, one USB port. I glanced at this and assumed that that was the case. This is a mini HDMI port, isn't it? So. Um, what would you want to use one of these things for? As mentioned, I think it would be a fantastic thing for running 3D printers. However, um, it does claim video playback of various types. Yeah, high quality video experience with stable, detailed and smooth picture quality. So I could see these things turning up in things like kiosks or, uh, you know, anything with a little bit of uh, in uh, interaction needed. Maybe you could even use it as part of a smart television as well. But if you would like to know a little bit more about it, I suggest just heading to the link in the description of the video. That is where you will find uh, this uh, uh, page. I'll bring myself back now. Hello. Actually, no, I'll do that so you can see this while I'm talking. Um, you'll find everything you need to know from the Orange Pi page, including various uh, um, images that are available for it already. Uh, there's all the usual suspects you would imagine. There is a Debian image for it, an Ubuntu image. There is an Android image for it. Uh, there's also, if I remember correctly, a third party Raspbian image for it. But yes, all of the hardware specs are here as well. Um, and if this is something that you are interested in and you're going to get one of these i would love to know why um i don't feel any particular need to upgrade from my pi zero two um because i don't necessarily need any more grunt i don't have anything that has a visual element to it at the minute however they are wonderful little boards that take up very little power and very little space and i'd be very interested to hear if any of you are using them in your home setups right now that was our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and just in case it showed up during the show, apologies if there's any background noise. I'm still experimenting with how best to uh, make this room not a furnace. So there has been a fan running for the whole show. Um, I'm using a little bit of noise cancellation to try and get rid of that. Um, if there has been any annoying background hum, especially for those of you who might listen to the show on headphones, do let me know and I will tweak it further. Um, but yes, thank you for all of the support that you continue to show Electromaker and the Electromaker show. I will be back next week with another show full of goodies from the maker and embedded world. I I hope you have a good one. I hope you have a safe, fun and creative week and I will chat to you then.